Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Lukowski. I'm the assistant director in the international program here at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and I'm very proud to welcome you to this occasion to learn and think about the social and aesthetic implications of eternal life. Tonight's symposium follows a three-year focus on modern and contemporary Russian art in our internal research initiative, CMAP, which included uh, a couple of trips to Russia and a meeting on Russian cosmism one year ago. This research was overseen by tonight's moderator, Ksenia Nuril, former CMAP fellow for Central and Eastern Europe and current Dodge fellow at the Zimmerli Art Museum at Rutgers University together with Roxana Markoch, leader of the research group and senior curator of photography here. The program this evening was conceived with Anton Vidogle of EFLUX, and another testimony to Anton's longstanding investigation into this topic uh, of tonight. Um, I also just wanted to flag this great little volume, Art Without Death, Conversations on Russian Cosmism, which includes contributions by all of tonight's speakers, along with other notable people like Franco Bifo Berardi, and I won't list everyone here, but um, it's gonna be, it is available in our second floor bookshop when the museum is open. Um, and before we get rolling, I just want to acknowledge the hard work of a couple of people. Um, on the MoMA side, Megan Forbes, Linnea West, Marta Danzi, and Rotana Shaker. Um, and in the booth back there, Michael Fuchs, Andy Barada and Mark Desaire, and on the EFLUX team, especially Amal Issa, as well as Rivers Pleskitis and Jacqueline Koch. And finally, we would not be here tonight without the generous support of Gregory Burke, the director of the Remai Modern, for his very generous support all along. Um, and thank you so much for coming, and I'm now passing the mic to my former dear colleague, Senya Nerville. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I would like to echo Sarah's welcome and gratitude to all those who helped bring this evening's program to fruition. Paraphrasing Fyodorov himself, it is wonderful to share the same universe, literally this stage, with such an esteemed panel of thinkers at this storied institution, whose history with Russia in the Soviet Union goes back to even before MoMA's establishment, when Alfred H. Barr Jr. visited the Soviet Union in winter 1927 and began collecting the avant-garde masterpieces that form the foundation of MoMA's collection today. It's not a coincidence uh, that we're gathered here today, uh, this month, uh, in the wake of the 100th uh, anniversary of the Russian Revolution. This is a moment that we, uh, this institution has marked um, already with uh, an exhibition as well as other programming. And it was very much on our minds when we began our conversations with Anton, who had visited uh, MoMA with Arseni more or less exactly one year ago in November 2016. So this is many, many months in the making. Um, tonight's panelists will address the idea of Russian cosmism and its relevance to our time um, and its influence on our technological imaginary. The last time I attended such an event that was co-organized by EFLUX and another New York institution, it was just days after Donald Trump was elected as United States president. I remember sitting like a zombie in the auditorium, letting the information wash over me. Although some things have not changed, I hope that we are gathered here tonight with acutely critical eyes and ears. While extended biographies of our panelists are found in your printed program, I'll just briefly foreshadow what's to come. Boris Groys, in his talk, will address the biopolitics of technological immortality and resurrection. Hito Steil will use her talk to consider the continued quests for the elixir of immortality, euthanasia, and genocide. 
Arseniy Zhilayev will trace the aesthetic ideals of Russian cosmism, including the building in collaboration with God, positioning the role of the artist as a co-producer of a godlike figure. Finally, Anton Vidocle will present a recent short film entitled The Communist Revolution Was Caused by the Sun, which calls upon the writings of Alexander Chivnevsky, who I'm sure you'll all hear more about tonight, uh, to moderate, um, to meditate on the relationship between humans and the sun and other I cosmic ideas. The program will close with a moderated conversation among the panelists and calls for questions from the audience. So without further ado, I welcome our first speaker. Thank you. After the October Revolution that was already mentioned here, many Russian thinkers, writers, and artists believed to be confronted uh, with a unique historical opportunity to undertake a radically new beginning, to turn history into a new direction. Among them were the representatives of biocosmist immortalists, a small political party that had its roots in the Russian anarchism. In the first manifest from 1922, they wrote, and I quote, uh, we take the essential and real right of man to be the right to exist, immortality, a resurrection, a rejuvenation, and the freedom to move in cosmic space, and not the supposed rights announced when the bourgeois revolution was declared in 1789, end of quotation. Alexander Svetagor, one of the leading biocosmic theoreticians, took immortality to be at once the goal and the prerequisite for a future communist society, since true social solidarity could only reign among immortals. Death separates people. Private property cannot be truly eliminated if every human being owns a private piece of time. In eternity, conflicts between individual and society will be eliminated because time will be collectivized. At the same time, immortality is the highest goal for every individual. For that reason, the individual will always remain faithful to society if this society makes immortality its own goal. At the same time, the communist society of immortals will be also interplanetary, cosmic society, that is, will occupy the entire space of the cosmos. These ideas were not so new for the Russian philosophical thinking. They were already formulated by Nikolai Fyodorov at the end of the 19th century, sometime before the October Revolution. Fyodorov called for the resurrection of all the generations ever lived on Earth and also sold the society of the future as a cosmic society of immortals. Svetagor tried to distinguish himself from Fyodorov by characterizing him as old-fashioned, even archaic. Even so, the family resemblance between Fyodorov and the biocosmos is all too obvious. They belong to the same tradition of the Russian cosmism that what originated before the revolution, but had a substantial development after it and influenced many writers and artists of the Russian avant-garde, especially Malevich and his school. Actually, the artistic avant-garde wanted a radical break with the past, even erasure of all the material traces of the past like traditional art and architecture, museums and libraries, etc. But the destruction of the material heritage of the past does not mean erasure of its traces in the souls of individuals and collectives. The subject that rejects the past still remains a product of this past. 
And that means that to be able to overcome man, traditional man, and its history, one has to get the power not over the future, but also over the past. The real rejection of the past does not mean its destruction. It means its reconstruction, a restaging, a reenactment. To get control over the future, one has to get control over oneself. But it is well known that we can know only what we have made. The naturally produced man cannot know and control oneself. Only artificially, technologically produced man is transparent for oneself. In other words, to become able to control the future, one has to become the origin of oneself. And to become the origin of oneself, one should reconstruct all his or her ancestors. The resurrection, reconstruction, reenactment of the historical past is a precondition for the power of the present and future. The idea one can find actually also in the writings, late writings of Walter Benjamin. The history becomes repeated, but repeated in a way that it ceases to be a mere chain of accidental events that goes from nowhere to nowhere. In other words, history ceases to be a process and becomes a project, a cosmic project. To start, um, the start uh, to Russian cosmism was given by the philosophy of the common task that Nikolai Fyodorov developed in the late 19th century. The project of the common task, in summary, consists in the creation of technological, social, and political conditions under which it would become possible to resurrect by technological means all the people who have lived in the historical past. He further was uh, reacting to internal contradiction in the series of the progress that dominated the 19th century mankind. Namely, the future generations were supposed to enjoy the happy utopian future only at the price of the cynical acceptance of the outrageous historical injustice, the exclusion of all previous generations from the realm of the future utopia. The progress has functioned as exploitation of the dead uh, in favor of the living, and exploitation of those alive today in favor of those who will live uh, later. But is it possible to think technology in terms that are different from the terms of historical progress, from the orientation towards the future? Fedor believes that a technology directed towards the past is possible and actually already exists. It is art technology, technology of art, and especially technology used by the art museums. The museum does not punish the obsoleteness of the individual museum items by the removal and destruction. That the museum is fundamentally at odds with the progress. The museum loves its items and gives a promise to keep them for a potentially infinite time. Progress consists in replacing old things with new things. However, for further of progress is not dictated by the inner dynamic of the technological development itself. According to Fyodorov, the technology produces new tools either for war or for fashion. And as he argued, war and fashion are created to uh, stimulate sexuality and production of the next generation. In other words, technology takes a form of progress only because it remains subjected to the organic animal life and its needs, an organic animal reproduction of the mankind. The technological production serves the biological reproduction of the mankind. That's why it is directed towards the future. That's when the technology will be turned around and used not to serve the production of the new generation, uh, but resurrection 
of the previous generations, the progress will be stopped. So it will be like a metanoia, yeah? like a, a return to the origin, but return to the origin not only uh, on the level of thinking and the level of ideas, but return to the origin on the level of technology itself and social organization, uh, so the social relationship based on technology. The Christian immortality of the soul is replaced here by the immortality of things or bodies in the museum. And divine grace is replaced by curatorial decisions and technology of museum preservation. Technology as a whole must become the technology of art, and the human history has to become the art history, because every human being will become an artwork. The overcoming of the boundaries between life and art is here not a matter of introducing art into life, but rather a radical museumification of life. By means of unification of living space and museum space, the biopower extends itself into infinity. It becomes the organized technology of eternal life. As soon as human beings become radically modern, that is, as soon as they are understood as bodies among other bodies and things among other things, they have to accept that state-organized technology will treat them accordingly. This acceptance has a crucial precondition, however. The explicit goal for a new power must be eternal life here on Earth for everybody. Only then, the state ceases to be a partial, limited biopower of the stored, described by Foucault, and becomes a total biopower. This can be seen as the last step in the secularization of Christianity, for secularization remains only partial if it merely negates senses and prohibits the hopes, desires, and demands for life that religion articulates. It is not enough, it is not enough to say that there is no immortality and to prohibit people from seeking immortality. Rather, one should show how the immortality could be reached by secular means. Russian cosmism inherited and radicalized the Marxist shift from divine grace to secular technology. However, there is one essential difference between the traditional Marxist project and cosmist project. Marxism does not raise the problem of immortality, the communist paradise on earth, that is supposed to be achieved through the combination of revolutionary struggle and creative work, is understood as a realization of harmony between man and nature, a harmony that secures the human happiness in the framework of the human nature, to which belongs also inevitability of the nature of death. On the contrary, the cosmism denied death the status of being nature of death for cosmic death and always artificial because it can be technologically prevented. And for cosmic nature is not a friend. The cos for the cosmic nature is an enemy. It's an enemy that kills us and destroys us. So we cannot survive if we do not control nature, if we do not nature under the technological control and make nature to art, yeah, make nature artificial. However, the artificial immortality is a fragile immortality. It's not ontologically given, like in the case of God or gods, but merely technologically secured. The dependence of the mankind on the cosmic events that are uncontrollable, even unknown, is a source of the specifically modern anxiety. One can say, cosmic anxiety. The anxiety of being part of cosmos and not be able to control it. Not accidentally, our contemporary mass culture is so much obsessed with the visions of asteroids coming from the black cosmic space and destroying the Earth, or maybe aliens. You know. 
but this anxiety has also more subtle forms. As an example, Walcott said the theory of the accursed shear that was developed by Georges Bataille. According to the theory, the sun always sends more energy to the Earth than the Earth, including the organisms living on its surface, can absorb. After all the efforts to use the energy for the production of goods and raising the living standards of the population, there also remains a non-absorbed, non-used uh, rest of the solar energy. This rest of energy, the accursed rest, um, is necessarily destructive. It can be spent only through violence and war, or at least through ecstatic festivals and sexual orgies that channel and absorb this rest of energy through the less dangerous activities. Thus, human culture and politics become also determined by the cosmic energies, forever shifting between order and disorder. Actually, uh, Bataille was more or less obviously influenced by Chizhevsky, uh, that will be treated in the film by Anton Vidokle. Uh, Chizhevsky propagated the theory of uh, additional energy coming from the sun that produce uh, additional and destructive activity uh, in mankind. Uh, and uh, he was lecturing here in New York uh, in the 20s in Paris. The Russian cosmist wanted to liberate the mankind from the cyclical processes caused by the struggle between chaos and order. In their eyes, only the technological control of the cosmos in its entirety could protect the fragile immortality uh, of the resurrected generations. Here, cosmism does not mean something like inner identification of the individual soul with the universal cosmic soul, a romantic project partially inspired by the Indian spiritual tradition that was revived by the theosophical and anthroposophical schools that were also very influential in Russia at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. The Russian cosmism was not spiritual and romantic, but rather materialist and constructivist. In this sense, it was well compatible with the constructivist avant-garde of the 1920s and also with the Marxist project of building a radically new society. There were also some practical consequences of the biopolitical projects. You remember that the goal was immortality, rejuvenation, and uh, movement, free movement in the cosmic space. Uh, so the Russian cosmic program, the space program, uh, had its origin actually in the biocosmos uh, ideology and requirements of building rockets that could bring the resurrected generation to the other planets. The founder of the Russian rocket science, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, actually produced his, designed and produced his first rocket uh, with his goal in mind. He was also a member of the movement. Another fascinating biopolitical experiment, also not as influential, was the Institute for Blood Transfusion that Alexander Bogdanov founded and directed in the 1920s. Bogdanov was, uh, had been a close ally of Lenin when they were young, a co-founder of the intellectual and political movement within the Russian Social Democratic Party that ultimately led to Bolshevism. Later, he increasingly distanced himself from contemporary politics and was sharply criticized by Lenin for his favorable view of Ernst Mach and his positivist philosophy. After the revolution, Bogdanov directed, created and directed the famous Proletkult, in which he promoted the non-professional writing and art produced by the ordinary workers. Later, Bogdanov became enthusiastic about experiments with blood transfusions, 
uh, which he hoped would slow the aging process, if not stop it completely. Blood transfusions from younger generation to older ones were supposed to rejuvenate the, older, the elderly and establish solidarity and balance among the generations that Bogdanov considered essential to establishing a just social society, especially between professors and students. As it happened, Bogdanov died for such a blood transfusion and died actually uh, consciously. Uh, he wanted to save a female student of him that had a very strange rare uh, blood disease. So he exchanged his blood uh, with the student. Student survived uh, and he died. It was a kind of semi suicidal act, actually. Uh, for a very long time, the general attitude to this idea was pretty much ironic, but the new experiments uh, confirmed that it happens when you um, exchange blood of old meat with uh, young meat, so everybody thinks with, uh, with humans will be the same. So now at the end of my talk, let me discuss the question with which every talk about Russian cosmism is inevitably confronted. Can one imagine the emergence of the society of the immortal humans that would be able to control the cosmic space in its entirety and would be willing to resurrect all the previous generations? Fyodor himself, like later as a biocosmist uh, immortalist, argued in a tradition of the enlightened egoism. They believed that the individuals would be ready to invest their energy into the building of the society of the immortals if they would be convinced that such a society will guarantee their own immortality. So they, they, they enter a kind of contract uh, with society. However, such a conviction is, as we know, always shaky. So I would prefer to answer this question in a way in which Plata answers the question of possibility of emerging of the ideal philosophical state as he described it in his famous Politeia. There, Plata writes that such a state is logically possible, even if empirically improbable. The same can be said about the cosmic project. Indeed, like Plata, the biocosmic immortalist did not make any assumption that would be illogical or unscientific. The arguments against the project could be only psychological or maybe sociological, but not logical. Thus one can say that the realization of this project is not probable, but also not impossible. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, and thanks so much, Anton, for having me we had these discussions already a couple of times, so it's for me always a, a bit confusing to try to start again from the beginning. But I think I will try to immediately pick up from where Boris Groys left off. And I think that it's important to ask the question, <coughs> So how are these ideas translated into contemporary reality? How do they relate to present day ideas of technological transhumanism and its contemporary discontents? So one thing I've learned, and I've learned a lot of things you know, during this ongoing discussion about cosmism, is that there seems to be a sort of paradox inherent in maybe the idea of immortality as a whole, but definitely this specific kind of immortality, which is that some kinds of immortality seem to be extremely lethal. So you are going to die from this type of immortality, um, most definitely. So um, this, I mean, there, there, there are, of course, historical precedents for um, lethal types of immortality. The story I always remember is about the strife 
uh, for immortality by Chinese emperors because there was a lot of immortality elixirs developed over time. And actually, immortality elixirs turned out to be a very likely cause of death for many Chinese emperors over, I mean, these, these, these kind of things were in use for almost 2,000 years. So this was a very likely cause of death. Many, peop many of these emperors were actively poisoned using those elixirs, pointing to this kind of strange dialectics between life and death. And this also appears in some strands of writings of people grouped uh, under the category of cosmists, for example, uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky that Boris Groys mentioned, um, thinks that has an idea of happy atoms, which, by the way, also would not be happy within certain bodies. He has a very clear idea of eugenics, you know, developed from this idea of happy atoms, which leads even to him calling for the extermination of defective bodies. Another person is even more enthusiastic in promoting this type of dialectics between life and death. Ilienko's A Cosmology of the Spirits advocates for nothing less but the annihilation of everything, even the whole universe, which seems to be a necessary precondition for reaching the goal of immortality. And I think we are seeing a resurgence of this dialectics of you know, lethality and immortality in contemporary ideas of cryonics, uh, transhumanism, uploading of the mind into mainframes, rejuvenation through blood transfusion, as Boris already said. And some of these discourses do not avoid at all, uh, on the contrary, frankly, embrace eugenicist ideas thus reviving discourses around eugenics, human breeding, that were used by right-wing fascists throughout the 20th century that actively wanted to modify the genetic makeup of humanity. Um, well, one very well-known example is, of course, contemporary uh, blood transfusion startups. There seems to be a startup in California that is now offering uh, transfusion of the plasma of teenagers and young adults for only $8,000. So how did we one get there? How did we get to the point of you know, ideas of human modification being so captured by reactionary forces? And I want to just as a sort of response screen, a very short um, video of mine, or actually rather it's a three channel installation uh, called The Tower, which tells the story of basically the end of Soviet space travel um, after 89. It tells the story of a company in Kharkiv, Ukraine, uh, close to the Russian border. It's a 3D company founded by a former space engineer who was trained as a rocket scientist but now is doing 3D modeling for Western luxury hotels. Вскоре после 11 сентября, во время охоты за Саддамом Хусейном, мы запустили другой проект, основанный на реальных событиях. Говорят, что Саддам Хусейн хотел реконструировать Вавилонскую башню. Он нашел историческое место, где находилась эта башня, и начал делать раскопки. В нашей игре Саддам все-таки построил эту башню, и у нее есть мистическое значение. Она служит входом в другие веры.
это Харьков, Украина. Этот город был центром компьютерной науки в Советском Союзе. Здесь я работаю. Мы 3D-компания. Мы производим системы между... Это наш офис. Мы занимаемся рендерингом, часто делаем аутсорсинговые заказы. Мы делаем многоквартирные дома, недвижимость в Европе и Эмиратах, а также аварийные симуляторы. Большинство западных компаний работают здесь, потому что наша рабочая сила дешевле. Конечно, они занимаются аутсорсингом. Многие из наших архитектурных проектов происходят из Европы. Это связано с идеей Нершор, в противоположность офшору. Нершор означает близость физического расстояния. До недавнего времени вы могли прилететь в Харьков австрийскими авиалиниями. Сейчас это уже невозможно из-за войны. По профессии я инженер по системе управления летательным аппаратом. Я должен был строить ракеты, космические корабли. Но когда Советский Союз развалился, Космическая программа закрылась, и люди пошли торговать на рынок. Тогда я начал свой бизнес. Я мечтал заниматься IT-бизнесом. Наша... I, I the subtitles are getting too small. He said he used to be trained as a space engineer. He was supposed to design rockets, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, the whole industry collapsed, and people, as he said, not himself, were forced to sell stuff in the streets. And re-watching this video in the context of the cosmism discussion really begged one question, where has ground control vanished to? And I think this is not only a question um, to ask in relation to the former Soviet territories, but also very crucially a question to ask in the US, you know? I mean, the defunding of NASA has been ongoing for a very long time. Also the delegitimization of NASA and its scientific results um, has gone pretty far. And it, I, it, it struck me that, you know, I grew up in West Germany, and for me, the idea of ground control was symbolized by one single word. I was just trained to equate it with the word ground control, and that word is Houston, 
right for me, if you say ground control, of course, it's in Houston. Where else in the world would it be? It's in Houston, okay. And I was used, you know, to this idea that whenever you have a problem, you can call Houston. They have the best engineers in the world, and they will sort of fix any problem you could imagine, right? And I think that this kind of ground control definitely has more developed into a sort of underground control, maybe given the recent you know, flooding and devastation of the city, which seems to indicate to me that there is a sort of massive process of deregulated urban underdevelopment going on, which throws the whole question of ground control into question. Okay, people are still able to go into space, but is there, who is, who is actually in control back on the ground? Is there still anyone left if you pick up the intercom, you know, and call Houston, will someone still respond? This is um, the question. And the interesting thing is that, of course, a lot, there have been attempts um, happening for many decades to try to rebuild, you know, this kind of nature into a form of artificial second nature that is tied to space colonization, but which is under control, which is not out as of control uh, through climate change and other, you know, factors, including rampant economic deregulation. And a very interesting project to me in that respect historically is the story of the so-called Biosphere 2, which was developed as a sort of par para maybe scientific experiment in order, um, first of all, to model, test model space colonization. That was an explicit goal, but also to try to create an absolutely self-sufficient contained habitat inside a glass cupola in Arizona. And this experiment happened in the 80s. Uh, two different sets of around eight scientists were sort of locked into the sphere, and they just had to survive in there, including the production of their own oxygen, uh, food, basically everything they needed to sustain themselves, they had to produce um, on their own. And you probably all know more or less the outcome of these experiments. <laughs> People almost, I mean, they suffocated because the oxygen was running very low at almost dangerous levels. Uh, food production was a problem. They completely fell out with one another in one of the groups. So there were actually two hostile factions imprisoned inside the sphere. And the only species that seemed to totally thrive in there were ants and cockroaches. <laughs> so I, I really... Um, I'm very fascinated by this experiment, not least because it was run for a while by Steve Bannon. He was the manager of this experiment, and actually he sort of pushed the uh, scientists to be even stricter uh, in not exchanging anything from the outside, which led to a sort of scientist revolt at a certain point. He was brought in to make the whole enterprise financially more viable, of course, and then the scientists, some of them, simply smashed the windows of the sphere. There was this kind of uprising. But there was a very interesting side effect from this experiment, which is not widely known, which is that there were apparently satellite feeds from the sphere showing the life of the inhabitants in the 80s. And one Dutch producer called John de Mole happened to watch these feeds and came up with the reality TV series Big Brother. So Big Brother is literally a product of Biosphere 2. And even though the sphere was supposed to be you know, contained and nothing was uh, supposed to be escaping from that sphere, the thing that indeed escaped from it was the whole idea of reality TV. Um, and one could say that uh, these formats, they are not based on, they are based basically on producing extinction as spectacle. They are based on celebrating the survival of the fittest, you know, all sorts of these Darwinist ideas. And on this level, 
this experiment was almost spectacularly successful, even if it's scientifically the results were pretty mixed. But one can say without any exaggeration that reality TV has become an important template for any sort of autocratic production of reality which is happening um, today. And in the same vein, you know, I was talking about a contained sphere from which something escapes as a sort of side effect, uh, something which is unforeseen, which no one could have predicted. I mean, this was definitely not the goal to produce, you know, a new um, entertainment format. But in the same sense, I think already from the, well, quite contained or at least non-mainstream sphere of transhumanist discourse and augmentation experiments uh, in terms of humanity, um, something already escaped from that sphere as well. And it is in the same uh, vein, um, not really predictable, and it's also a low-tech version of you know all these lofty ideas of transhumanism and mind extension and uploading of the mind and so on, because I think that today the real existing version of um, transhumanist reformatting of humankind is actually also being realized in a low-tech way by simply uh, trying to get rid of as many healthcare systems as possible. So I think that this is actually the real existing form of some kind of accelerated extinction regime, which is, of course, also um, helped or accelerated by border regimes and state violence, negating, preventing, or destroying um, healthcare programs is the most important transhumanist policy happening today, and it's been underway for a long, long time. And another version of this real existing reactionary transhumanism is, of course, attacks on women's rights, reprodu reprodu reproductive rights to monopolize as much biopolitical control as possible. So people try to grab control over life's production and reproduction by any means, religious, economic, legal, scientific. And this, of course, spawns these fantasies of reproduction being wrested from female control via genetic engineering labs and, and so on and so on, basic reproduction without women. They are automated, sorry. So if this Production and reproduction of life is already a cosmic activity, then one has to recognize that there are strong connections to reproductive labor and so-called domestic activities. And in that sense, if cosmism is really about maintaining and assisting and maybe prolonging life, then I think that basically caretakers and nurses and cooks and cleaners are the first cosmists, the ones that have been doing this activity all along anyway. So basically, it's about the labor of love. And of course, all these activities are highly gendered, relegated to say slaves and servants, and so on, and so on, and so on. And basically, if we talk about cosmism today as opposed to the reactionary kinds of transhumanism I have been briefly mentioning, then these are the advanced cutting edge technologies we need to build on. And I want to remind everyone that the <coughs> most successful transhumanist technology ever has created the current shape of humankind. And this technology is actually cooking. You know, I mean, the species of humans as they exist now was created through uh, cooking because this sort of modified the brain or allowed it, you know, to expand to uh, the biological state we are in now. So basically, um, I think that if we talk about communism, <laughs> we need to talk about cooking, fashion, dressmaking, childcare, and so on and so on, which could be a huge 
part of another push to transform human existence, existence into something which is way more pleasurable, at least, and sustainable, whether this involves extending life or not. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Arsene Jelaev, and I'm artist. I'm not professional theoretician and researcher. Uh, but I'd like to share with you uh, some notes on uh, cosmic, uh, cosmic aesthetics uh, that appeared as part of my artistic research. Initially, uh, it started at, as my interest to Marxist museology. Uh, that was a kind of hidden, uh, unknown part of a productivist uh, movement and parallel cult movement but then uh, ended up as an uh, interpretation of museum and its role in producing of life uh, within uh, uh, philosophy of Russian cosmism. So I, I would like to tell you today about um, the aspects of the aesthetics of cosmism um, uh, that intersect uh, with the notions of uh, contemporary art. This task is uh, rather complicated for a variety of reasons. Uh, one major um, obstacle is the fact that uh, Russian cosmism itself is a little known in, uh, uh, in the West and uh, English-speaking audience. Surprisingly, from the point of view of the philosophical canon, its arrival into the realm of public attention and intellectual discussion is very recent. The, fund, uh, the foundational cosmist uh, texts written between the late 19th and early 20th centuries have only been translated into English uh, in the last year or two. Even in its uh, motherland, cosmism occupies a marginal position. The term Russian cosmism arose in intellectual um, parlance uh, in the USSR in the 1970s and um, its usage is still being uh, debated by some researchers, even though the very word cosmism uh, was used by artists and poets associated with the historical avant-garde in 1920s. Today, uh, this is an umbrella term that un uh, unites disparate and sometimes polar position in relation to outer space, the development of life, and the place of the human and God uh, in this process. In, some, uh, in, uh, in a sense, uh, it is not surprising that even now cosmism is still mm, sometimes perceived as an exotic intellectual movement with a national flavor. Um, a further complication exists. Um, even those aspects of uh, cosmist uh, aesthetics which are close to discussions within contemporary art um, examples that go beyond the latter's known extremes. Nevertheless, uh, this fact makes uh, them especially valuable in series of the search for what could replace the aesthetic canon of the 20th century. And there are four aspects uh, that uh, could intersect with contemporary art. First one uh, is uh, life creation or жизнестроение uh, in Russian, and I'm going to speak uh, precisely on uh, this topic today. Second one uh, is um, interpretation within cosmism of beauty as a kind of uh, ontological category, which could uh, correspond with uh, some contemporary uh, Marxist uh, interpretation of uh, uh, of art. Uh, third one uh, is uh, futuristic or futurologistic function of uh, art, and I guess uh, aesthetic uh, aesthetics of Russian cosmism share this uh, function with uh, mm, not only uh, historical avant-garde art but uh, socialistic realism and I guess pre-modernistic art as well. And the uh, last one <coughs> is a debate on the synthesis of art, um, which again um, um, 
is topics that uh, exist on territory of contemporary art, uh, for example, in uh, uh, articles of Boris Groys on uh, total installation. Um, each of these aspects of the aesthetics of cosmism deserves separate research and debate. But today I will focus on the first one, life creation and its attendant characteristics. As mentioned earlier, in the territory of contemporary art, life creation corresponds to the experiments of Russian leftist constructivist and productivist artists who were close to the theorist Boris Arvatov. Um, according to Arvatov's interpretation of Marxism, after the proletarian revolution, when the means of production pass into the hands of the liberated oppressed classes, art will cease to exist in the form in which it did under capitalism. From the creative ghetto in which social and class conflicts are resolved through means of imagination, art becomes a part of life and production. After all, revolutionary changes must sooner or later lead to the disappearance of class and the very ground, of, uh, and the very ground for um, creatively resolved conflicts. Of course, Arvatov understood that the role of art in the uh, 1920s was far from the limits of the project of liberation designed by Marxism. However, uh, the same thing could be said about Soviet Russia. In an almost agrarian country, the proletarian revolution retroactively gave a starting point for producing the proletariat itself. Even more, this was done keeping in mind that the final uh, intended destination was the dissolution of all classes, but not the eternal state of industrial workers. Productivism tried to pull the same trick. But miracle, but a miracle didn't happen. A logical consequence of the described state of affairs was uh, the failure of the project of radical constructivism. Instead of overcoming the division between creative and manual labor, the disappearance of easel art and the emergence of an artist engineer, the recognized experiments of productivism were limited to things like textile and interior design projects. However, today uh, this failure seems to be the peak of unprecedented breakthrough of contemporary creativity. Today, despite a relatively small study of post-revolutionary uh, avant-garde and productivist art, it is commonly believed that uh, it is logical, albeit radical, consequence of Marxist theory. However, already in 1920s and 1930s, a heated debate arose over the interpretation of Marxist aesthetic heritage. When so-called stream of the 60, uh, of uh, 1930s uh, uh, formed under the influence of the young philosopher Mikhail Lifshitz became a primary opponent of the Arvatov circle. Knowledge of Lifshitz in the English-speaking world is on average limited by his um, proximity to Hungarian Marxist uh, uh, Georg Lukács, as well as by his rejection of modernism. The letter automatically tran um, translated him into Western art history as part of a long line of conservatives and uh, Stalinists. Lifshitz certainly understood and uh, accepted the possible consequences of the vulgarization of his intellectual constructs. However, his philosophical system was much more complex and uh, well-founded than the image of art that grew on its soil. As a, as a student of Hutemas, a foremost producer of young innovators in art at the time, Lifshitz decided to be consistent uh, with the logic of the radicalization of art taught by the main uh, subversions of the past. This led the failed artist to deny avant-garde negation and attempts to comprehend a proper aesthetic position of Marx. 
name that used previously for covert creative neg negativity. In his student years, Lifshitz prepared a monograph entitled Marx and Engels on Art, composed of text and fragments related uh, to aesthetic theory. Later, he would call this compilation his most important work. Lifshitz opposes the vulgarization of Marxism and productivism and the sociologically orientated museology presented by Alexei Fyodor Davidov. According to Lifshitz's uh, reconstruction, Marx uh, defends realism or high realism in terminology of Lifshitz, Lifshitz as uh, a truly materialistic form of creative expression. This interpretation assumes, on the one hand, a high level of uh, reflectivity of reality itself, which shows the level of elaborating its social elements or main conflict, and, on the other hand, the artistic readiness to reflect reality in its integrity. This position is close to what uh, Georg Luch uh, Lukács will uh, express in relation to realism. An example of high realism can be found in paintings by um, Ilya Repin, for example, who was a member of Peredvizhniki, Wanderer in English, a group of socially engaged and realistic authors. Clement Greenberg later <coughs> designated the artist's production as kitsch. But high realism can also, for example, be seen in the icons of Andrei Rublev or in Andrei Platonov's prose, which is often recognized as a pinnacle of Soviet modernism. Propagandistic examples of socialist realism, on the contrary, cannot uh, boast a holistic reflection of reality. Rather, they uh, distort it and only harm the cause of socialist construction. Modernism, even in the case of great artists who considered themselves to be communists or critics of society, cannot be considered as uh, high realism. Yes, uh, it can be said that uh, Pablo Picasso <coughs> or, for example, Andy Orhol, uh, a descendant of uh, migrant workers who can hardly commit sins typical for artists representing more privileged classes, reflects uh, a deeper um, degradation of creative values in terms of commodity fetishism and even in terms of hope for a new democracy. But this reflection is only an effective fragment of reality and not its integral image. Moreover, the very reality of uh, developed capitalism is so distorted by the logic of commodity, uh, commodity fetishism, which practically speaking does not lend itself to a holistic reflection. Any masterfully transmitted fragment will always be a distortion, will always be weaker than a work of art, albeit clumsily, but nonetheless expressing the truth of the whole. It's difficult to disagree with Lifshitz's conclusion after making a detailed acquaintance uh, with the logic of Marxist aesthetic assessments. At least they don't naturally lead to the dissolution of creative activity in production of life. For such an interpretation to be possible, artistically orientated or more accurately anti-artistically orientated Soviet Marxism had to pass through a filter of the aesthetic debates provoked in Russia Russian context by uh, Richard Wagner and Gesamtkusverk and the philosophy, the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche and the reflection in symbolist poetry and philosophy of Kasmism. <coughs> uh, for Nikolai Fyodorov, a Russian religious thinker who worked in the second half of the 19th century, art begins with an act of uh, bipedalism, uh, when a man rises uh, to his feet and overcomes the force of gravity on Earth. According to Fyodorov, art then continues with a memorial prayer for the dead, as well as through attempts to bring them back to life through the power of the visual image. Further development of art occurs through religious rituals and church architecture. Together, these elements most clearly express the secret of any creative act, act uh, the desire for ultimate justice, namely eternal life and reunification with, uh, 
deceased uh, loved ones. But even the most beautiful depiction of resurrection is incapable of um, manifesting a return to life in the physical world. Under this logic, creati uh, creativity is interpreted as a failed attempt to find technolo technology capable of real resurrection. It then follows uh, that creativity or art can instead only serve as an attempt to compensate for human weakness before death inevitably sets in. Seeing art in this way as merely a virtual depiction of the desired result is of course insufficient for the philosopher who through this uh, theory of common task aims to justify the mobilization of the struggle against human fate and in general the fate of every living organism uh, and whose ultimate goal for humanity is eternal life and resurrection. With this in mind, Fyodorov introduces a division, creating two distinct categories of art, Ptolemyak, Ptolemyczeska, Iskustva, Ptolemic art and Kopernikan, Kopernikanska uh, Iskustva. He defines Ptolemic art as, um, as the creation of imaginary similarities, that is um, art that uh, satisfied only with imaginary resolution of those conflicts to which it refers. Copernican art, in Fyodorov's formulation, is uh, the active creative transformation of reality in order to achieve material resurrection. The most important factor in uh, the transition from the first category of art to the other is uh, a conscious institutionalization of creative activity in the museum. Fyodorov insisted uh, that the museum must in turn cease to exist only as passive storage space for the old, for what he deems funeral uh, practices. And uh, here you can read a quotation from uh, him that was uh, written in uh, his essay, uh, The Art of Resemblance and the Art of Reality in uh, 1890s. The ultimate institutionalization of art its um, collectivization, as well as its connection with science and educational activity, unexpectedly seem to serve as more suitable theoretical framework for constructivism than the aesthetic theory of orthodox Marxism. Unlike other representatives of Russian religious thought, Fyodorov do, does not confine himself to pointing out mystical landmarks as being in themselves sufficient to act as the basis for a transition to life creation. In contrast, Fyodorov's contemporary, uh, the philosopher and poet Vladimir Solovyov, uh, wrote about continuing creation, which is uh, embodiment in the chaotic uh, matter of the divine principle, including through man. The philosopher understood beauty as a degree of spiritualization of the material world, as a spiritual corporeality. Art in the form in which it exists um, at this stage is only a prophecy. It is, Solovyov says, the link between the beauty of nature and the beauty of the future life. As with Fyodorov, this is not enough. There is a need of transition to life creation, which Solovyov insists uh, must embody the absolute ideal in more than one imagination, but indeed it must spiritualize, transubstantiate our real life. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Fyodorov criticized Solovyov for uh, excessively obscuring thoughts with poetic images, as well as for refusing the rational planning of the common task in favor of the uncertainty of mystical revelation. Another important name in the discussion um, on life creation is Nikolai Berdyaev. 
in his 1916 work, The Meaning of Creativity, the philosopher Follin Fodorov and Solovyov points to the insufficiency of art as a separate sphere of human activity. However, thinkers and artists at the end of 19th and the beginning of 20th century may already see symptoms indicating art's forthcoming transformation. In um, analyzing the cultural figures of that time, Dostoevsky, Wagner, or Picasso, Berdyaev um, comes to the conclusion that the state of art is in crisis. He writes about the tragedy of the artist creator, posed in front of the dilemma of creating life itself or creating a work of art. In the era that made perfect, classically beautiful art almost impossible. But this symptomatology is not evidence of uh, decay. On the contrary, Berdyaev says the crisis of old ideas about art indicates the onset of a new era, namely the era of the third revelation. It must consist in the discovery by man uh, within him or herself of the possibility of divine co-creation or ontological co-production with God. This revelation was not included in the New Testament because uh, real creativity opposes any obligation and should be accessed by man without divine help. And this does not mean that God does not expect creativity from uh, humankind. On the contrary, he or she, in the tradition of Russian religious thinkers, God is an androgyn, needs our collaboration. According to Berdyaev's philosophy, true creativity resists the logic of the world. A person dependent on it, the need to take it into account for his or her own survival, the necessity as such is a consequence of the fall and its redemption. For art, this means um, being doomed to create only similarities, only presentations, or to exist only as part of an institutional ghetto excluded from life. Moreover, um, despite the second revelation, the appearance of Jesus Christ, the uh, God-man who died for our sins, Christian theology remains redemptive and fierce creativity. But if redemption is already granted, theology cannot remain only negative, focused on the struggle against dependence on this world. Berdyaev criticized bourgeoisness, a, pra um, a pragmatic a being of this world and blindness in relation to the true meaning of the appearance of Christ. According to uh, the philosopher, from the same logic of redemption grows the rationality of science and the human economy. And pre-modernistic classical fine art is just an example of the same kind. It is too uh, prudent, not carefree, talented, but not brilliant. On the contrary, the modernist rejection of uh, the already well-known canon, uh, the realization of the impossibility of achieving integrity in this world, here and now, points to the beginning of a new era. In it, the creative life of a genius who opposes him or herself to the pragmatics of this world, but still has to create similarities, must unite uh, with the activity of the holy ascetic, who also opposes the world in the desire to approach another being, but is deprived of the creativity of genius. This union should bring the second coming of Christ already transformed, creating and not suffering in the name of redemption of the people. Berdyaev and Fyodorov differ in many uh, respects. The first notes the crucial importance of the second, his genius in the question uh, of the active creative role of man in relation to the embodiment of divine plans. At the same time, for Berdyaev, the philosophy of the common task is still too centered on the Old Testament, too determined by duty and redemption. After all, resurrection is justified as a consequence of the interrogable ethical depths with the 
dissidents are forced to bear before the departed ancestors. In turn, creativity, especially true co-creation, collaboration of man with God, is the ultimate freedom, standing radically beyond any obligation. Then the common task is based mainly on labor, not just a mystical or spiritual impulse. But labor is a payment that person must make for his or her fall. Finally, the Fedorovian uh, connection of science and art for Berdyaev will create a serious compromise with the world of obligation. In other words, everything connected with the order of this world in the form in which it exists today uh, is an ongoing <coughs> attainment that is only beginning to truly um, comprehend the revelation uh, of Christ who has already redeemed for man uh, sinfulness. Fedorov turns out to be too conservative for Berdyaev's position as it presupposes the resurrection of the beings already created by God, but not the emergence of new ones, not the inscrement in of uh, being. Resurrection of the deceased does not constitute a creative breakthrough into the future. It is not the eternal creative formation of the spirit, uh, characteristic of the logic of the third revelation. The common task, even with its li um, limitation in terms of victory over days and the resurrection of all creation, remains only an atonement. Berdyaev points out resurrection can only be realized in another world, and for this purpose the second coming of Christ is needed as the consequence of the revelation of creativity. Let's try to present a potential answer to this from Fedorov's perspective. If resurrection is a conservative matter, an Old Testament thing, then why is revolutionary discovery of human co-creation with God necessary for Berdyaev? Is Christ not a great conservative in that case, and the revolution itself a return to the true state of affairs or a direct appeal to God, like when in Middle Ages this word was used for uh, describing the act of becoming a believer. If through the coming of Jesus into the world of the determination and fall, human reveals God within and God through him or herself reveals a man, then this world has the same divine status uh, as the other holy world. And if a person de developing in her or himself religious creative boldness develops the divine, why can he or she not approach Christ as a limit of uh, human nature? Yes, one might say, second advent of God in this world, of course, is necessary for resurrection if we are moving along the lines of the logic of active Christianity. However, the immortal life is already in each of us, but what is missing is the immortal man and those who, due to belonging to physical world, have departed into another world. And uh, manca mankind can and must take responsibility for replacing this um, shortage, or in other, world, in other words, for the embodiment of the promise of the resurrection of all the dead to eternal life. And if so, Jesus, who had not only divine but uh, also human physical nature, must be returned to earth as well, but by means of our creativity. This would be an absolute logical consequence of the project of the common task, culminating in the era of free life creation by man and God that knows no limits. Thank you. Hello. What I thought I'd do tonight is show a short film I made uh, two years ago. It's a part of a trilogy that uh, I've been working in for about almost five years now uh, called Immortality for All. It uh, basically it's, uh, consists of three 30 minutes films, of which we will show the second one today. It was shot in Kazakhstan. Uh, largely because Fedorov uh, spent quite a bit of time in Almaty, which used to be the capital of Kazakhstan, and also because one of the other key sort of thinkers and participants of this movement, Alexander Chizhevsky, was uh, in a labor camp 
in another major city in Kazakhstan, which is called Karaganda, which is a really incredible place. Uh, probably, as most of you know, uh, Baikonur, which is the former Soviet and now Russian space sort of port, is located in Kazakhstan. But in the beginning, when the spaceships went into the orbit, they kind of uh, le they landed in Karaganda. Uh, but ultimately, it was actually quite strange because the city was populated primarily by prisoners. It was almost like an outdoor prison for about 1.5 million people, uh, very many of them political prisoners. So it, uh, you know, it, it's completely uh, maybe unusual that the cosmonauts, astronauts, you know, had all of this freedom to, to uh, you know, cir circle around this earth, but actually the place that they came down to was a, a kind of a prison, yeah? But it's also kind of a, a very fascinating place because so many uh, uh, prisoners that were uh, either interned there in the camps or later living there in exile were members of the Soviet avant-garde, scientific avant-garde, artistic avant-garde, literary avant-garde. So actually it had the highest or one of the highest sort of educational one of the best educational systems in the Soviet Union, which was in, in a certain way perhaps even superior to Moscow, Leningrad, or other uh, kind of urban centers. So it was kind of a very paradoxical place. Um, I think I will not speak too much. Let's uh, screen the film. It's approximately 30 minutes, and then if you have questions afterwards, I will be happy to answer them. So let's start. Устраивайтесь удобнее. Если хотите, можете двигаться, как делаете это во сне. Это поможет вам расслабиться. Как только вы почувствуете себя достаточно удобно, сосредоточьте внимание на своих ступнях. Представьте, что чувствуете в них приятное тепло тепло и расслабленность. Вы чувствуете, как ваши ступни расслабляются. Пусть это тепло усиливается и распространяется по всему вашему телу. Когда вы дышите, ощущение тепла поднимается по мышцам ваших ног. Почувствуйте, как тепло и расслабленность проникают в ваши мышцы. Обратите внимание, вы больше не чувствуете ступней. Настолько они расслаблены. Глубоко расслаблены. Без малейшего усилия ваше дыхание начинает насыщать этим ощущением мышцы вашего тела. Вы чувствуете расслабленность в икрах. Ваши мышцы настолько расслаблены, что вы полностью перестаете обращать на них внимание. Между тем, эта расслабленность распространяется вверх, как жидкость, пропитывающая кубик сахара. Не нужно обращать внимание на то, как ваше тело само собой расслабляется. Мышцы вашей шеи и челюстей, ваш язык, ваше лицо — кожа головы и уши. Все, от пальчиков ног до макушки. Тепло и расслабленность. Глубокая расслабленность. Пока вы сидите в покое и удобстве, дыша легко и свободно. Вы больше не чувствуете своего тела. Оно почти невесомо. Наслаждайтесь этим чувством, этим ощущением тепла, в то время, как ваш разум начинает чувствовать себя свободно. Ваши мысли концентрируются на важном, без всяких усилий. Вы полностью управляете собой.
Мы находимся в Караганде, чтобы установить аэроионоаспираторий – электрическую люстру, способную выделять отрицательно заряженные ионы. Она соответствует конструкции, которую разработал один советский ученый, который поклонялся Солнцу. Он находился в Караганде очень много лет. Сначала как заключенный из правительно-трудового лагеря, начальство которого позволило ему совершать свои научные опыты по ночам в тюремной камере. Затем в лагере при угольной шахте, где он открыл помещение с аэроионофикацией для продления жизни заключенных в тюремный санаторий камера для восстановления здоровья. Ленин умер зимой. По традиции тело нужно было держать открытым в течение трех дней до оплакивания, прежде чем положить его в гроб и похоронить. Церемонию оплакивания можно увидеть на ютюбе. Толпы скорбящие, снег, цветы, солдаты и лошади, река людей, сопровождающих тело. Выглядит странно, будто в трансе. Многие плачут. За эти три дня более сотни тысяч человек пришло посмотреть на тело. Люди шли и шли. Было принято решение оставить тело для всеобщего обозрения в деревянном амзолее. Спустя пару месяцев это стало походить на чудо. приобрела нетленность. Затем зима кончилась, и тело начало разлагаться. Срочно нужно было что-то делать. Пара берег зарядил на на брат не тет на кем не было. Рахмет сара. Тело Ленина 
было забальзамировано с помощью смеси глицерина и формальдегида. Формальдегид уничтожал бактерии, а глицерин сохранял влагу в тканях. Мозг был извлечен из черепа и передан ученым. Троцкий пропустил похороны, потому что Сталин назвал ему не ту дату. Здоровое движение крови по нашему телу определяется отрицательным зарядом ионов красных кровяных телец. Отрицательный заряд. Вот что способствует движению крови по сосудам человеческого тела. Протяженность которых составляет 100 тысяч километров без препятствий и заторов. Красные кровяные тельца впитывают кислород из легких и доставляют его во все ткани и органы человека. Если атомы кислорода подвергать электричеству, он придает им отрицательный заряд. Красные кровяные тельца распределяют отрицательно заряженные ионы кислорода из легких по всему организму человека. Результатом может стать облегченное дыхание, избавление от боли и дискомфорта. Древние египтяне верили что душа возвращается в мумифицированное тело. Более трех тысяч лет назад один из фараонов создал новую религию, посвященную единственному Богу, Солнцу. Этот фараон поклонялся солнечной энергии и называл себя сыном Солнца. Он говорил, ты в моем сердце нет никого иного, кто бы знал тебя, исключая твоего сына Эхматона. Ты посвятил его в свои замыслы и в свое могущество. Мир в твоей руке. Ты создал людей. Когда ты всходишь, они живут. Когда ты заходишь, они умирают. Ибо ты длительность превыше своих членов. Тобою живы люди. И их глаза смотрят на твою красоту.
нас питает не земля, а солнце. Солнечная энергия является неудержимым источником жизни. Существование жизни не случайно. По своей сути, она отражение излучения Солнца. Развитие жизни на планете соответствует интенсивности солнечной энергии. Поверхность этой планеты образована живым веществом. Биосфера принимает множество форм энергии. Энергию движения и энергию изменения. Эта энергия питается и поддерживается Солнцем. Солнечная энергия накапливается и концентрируется живым веществом биосферы. Биосфера трансформирует солнечное излучение кислород, окутывающий поверхность Земли. Выдающая этой планете ее уникальные особенности. Источник и сущность нашего богатства – излучение Солнца. Оно поступает к нам также благодаря тяжелому подземному труду рудокопов. Солнечное излучение порождает избыток энергии, которую необходимо потратить. Поедание других биологических видов – одна из форм такой роскоши. Половое размножение – другая. Ведь оно обеспечивает значительную трату энергии. Смерть тоже роскошь. Она не есть что-то необходимое. Во имя неразрушимой энергии космоса, во имя истинной религии культа предков, во имя истинного социального равенства, означающего бессмертие для всех, во имя любви, мы должны воскресить наших предков из космических частиц, как минералы, как оживленные растения, солнечными, самокормящимися, коллективно осознающими, бессмертными, транссексуальными, на Земле, в космических кораблях, на космических станциях и на других планетах.
Такие люстры хотели установить во все советские космические корабли для поддержания здоровья космонавтов. Вместо этого их установили в кабинетах членов правительства, дабы предотвратить их дряхление. Мы с вами находимся на кладбище, где мы хотим установить очень большую тарелку подобного типа. Мы хотим понять, как она воздействует на людей, животных, растения, погодные условия. Ученый, поклонявшийся Солнцу, написал книгу, из-за которой у него начались неприятности. Это было исследование воздействия Солнца на человеческую историю. Во время Первой мировой войны, наблюдая в телескоп солнечные пятна, ученый заметил удивительное соответствие. Сразу после того, как вдоль центрального меридиана Солнца появлялась серия пятен, на разных фронтах происходили ожесточенные бои. Пораженный этим наблюдением, ученый предпринял сравнительный исторический анализ солнечной активности и поведения человеческих масс. Он сопоставил имеющиеся сведения о солнечной активности с ключевыми историческими событиями, зафиксированными в разных частях света на протяжении последних 300 лет. Результаты показывают, что в периоды максимальной активности Солнца происходило следующее. Общественные волнения, революции, войны, экономические взлеты и падения, эпидемии и так далее. Активность Солнца циклична. Солнечные пятна, вспышки и корональные выбросы проходят фазы минимальной и максимальной активности, которые чередуются с периодичностью примерно в 11 лет, 9 раз за столетие. Каждый солнечный цикл является также циклом исторических событий, историометрическим циклом. Ученый разделил историометрический цикл на четыре отдельных периода, каждый из которых характеризуется степенью возбуждения коллективной психики. Первый период, соответствующий минимальной активности Солнца, отличается апатичным, депрессивным состоянием. В этот период преобладают такие чувства и настроения, как смирение, пассивность, терпимость, миролюбие. Такая психологическая атмосфера создает условия для прекращения войн, заключения мирных соглашений и капитуляций. Также этот период весьма продуктивен для искусств, наук и для творческой деятельности в целом. Второй период характеризуется подъемом общественного настроения и усилением активности. 
образованием общественных позиций и мнений, формированием политических альянсов и объединением вокруг определенных идей. Во время третьего периода синхронизация солнечной активности и человеческого поведения достигает пика. Доминирующее общественное настроение этого периода – уверенность, оптимизм, решительность, энтузиазм. Общество приходит в пассионарное состояние и легко мобилизируется харизматичными личностями, политическими и военными лидерами, одаренными ораторами и так далее. Симптомами этого периода являются беспокойство и волнение, войны, завоевания и мятежи. В это время единство внутри социальных групп позволяет им решать комплексные политические и военные задачи. Большая часть социальных противоречий и разногласий сменяется чувством солидарности. Распространяются мистические, эзотерические и оккультные учения, а также маниакальные идеи. Обычными становятся массовые психологические иллюзии или психические эпидемии. Четвертый эстенометрический период является фазой снижения психосоциального возбуждения. Психологическое единство масс начинает ослабевать. Политические и военные альянсы распадаются. Войны достигают мертвой точки, усиливаются сепаратистские тенденции. Недостаток общественного единства тормозит массовые действия. Постепенно снижение возбудимости снова приводит общество в состояние апатии. Таким образом, Солнце воздействует на ритм всех исторических процессов. Ученый, поклонявшийся Солнцу, писал. Человек не только земное существо, но и космическое. Всей своей жизнью, молекулами и частицами своего тела, связанное с космосом, с космическими лучами, его потоками и полями. Внимание! Сконцентрируйтесь. Я хочу, чтобы вы представили, что стоите на распутье. Когда вы всматриваетесь в дорогу, ведущую налево, то замечаете, что она холодна, бесплодна, неприветлива и мертва. 
Небо над ней уныло, моросит холодный дождь. Деревья лишены листьев, а траву давно сменили твердые, холодные камни. Дует холодный ветер. Это место мертво. Это дорога, ведущая к смерти. Когда вы отворачиваетесь от этой дороги и всматриваетесь в ту, что ведет направо, то видите прекрасную тропу. В бездонном, ясном синем небе ярко сияет солнце. Деревья покрыты густой листвой, а трава сочна и зелена. Когда вы идете по этой тропе, вы чувствуете теплый, легкий бриз, играющий вашими волосами. Каждым шагом вы чувствуете себя все здоровее и здоровее, все сильнее и сильнее. Это дорога, ведущая к бессмертию. С каждым шагом вы чувствуете себя все более живым и все более уверенным, то уже ничто не заставит вас вернуться к той холодной, унылой, мертвой дороге. Вы выбрали жизнь. Бесконечную, здоровую, сильную жизнь. И ничто не сможет этого изменить. Ныне каждый положительный сдвиг запечатлен в глубинах вашего подсознания. Каждый положительный сдвиг усиливается в вашем разуме снова и снова с каждым вашим вздохом. Thank you all for your talks tonight. Um, each talk was very different, but obviously there was something very cyclical and nature um, throughout them all. Uh, I'm very glad that someone like Tsiolkovsky came up um, because in my mind, uh, in preparing for tonight, I had him uh, in mind, specifically his phrase, the earth is the cradle of reason, but we cannot stay in this cradle forever. Um, and made me think through your talks, why not? Um, is it death that's going to get us in the end? Um, or is it you know, the exploration of, of other planets, of the cosmos, and so we're meant to be there? Or is it a little bit of both? Um, and I think this kind of obsession with death that we've expressed tonight is very prescient. I mean, I don't know about you, but it's the reason why I run 10 miles every week and why people are studying the genetics of, uh, you know, those in their hundreds trying to figure out, you know, which recalls all the talk of elixirs and transfusions um, and Hito's really beautiful um, talk tonight. Mm. 
So I guess I wanted to um, sort of ask you guys, we talked a lot about art. Um, maybe this question could be directed more towards Arseni, but also to those who had shown us their works tonight. Um, Anton, Hito, you know, how, how are these uh, cosmic, cosmic ideas affecting contemporary art today um, in, in, in very direct ways? You're looking at me. Okay. This is scary. Uh, because there was also a lot of figures in the room tonight. I mean, totally, Boris's yeah. and Ar Arsenis talk specifically and, and competitions between the biocosmists and the older cosmists, between um, Berdaev and Fyodorov. So how are we, how are we mapping this, this cosmos? Um, it's such a gigantic question, I, I cannot even begin to sort of answer it by myself, but maybe I will just focus on one tiny aspect of a potential sort of significance. Sure, let's get the conversation this, yeah. going, and then I'm yeah. sure there are questions from the audience we can open But for one up. thing, it has a little bit to do with um, maybe some kind of a different articulation, different understanding of modernism. And maybe this is interesting to talk about since we are in the Museum of Modern Art, you know, and... Uh, where if you look at modernism, let's say it's Soviet modernism through cosmism, yeah, you actually get a completely different sort of understanding or reading of, of very familiar artworks that we have all kind of grown up with and have been kind of educated with, like the Black Square, like uh, Malevich's Architectons. And so basically very quickly you find out that maybe the kind of dualism that exists within the canonical history of art between, um, let's say, a more formalist reading of this works and a more ideological reading, more political reading, uh, that there is actually something else that's operating that, you know, perhaps was much more directly influential on the artists themselves that produced these works, yeah? So one way to look at the Black Square, as Hito and Boris Groys pointed out, Boris in Berlin and Hito in her recent introduction to the new issue of Reflect Journal, you could see it as, as a kind of a formalist plane, you know, this uh, ultimate sort of simplicity of, yeah, you could read it like that, but you could also see it as a mimetic painting, yeah, as, 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 as an image of the black sky, as the image of cosmos, as a, re as a representation. And, you know, there is no such a big contradiction. That, and for example, for me, and I went to art school in New York, uh, this was in the 80s, and, you know, so the, at the time, here in New York, it was incomprehensible. Why would Milevich make representational figurative paintings after having painted a black square? How can you go back like that? And because it seemed like a step backwards, it, looks like, it, it looked like a kind of a regressive, something quite negative, like giving up, like a certain kind of a failure. Whereas, in fact, it's not... Yeah, the, 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 the whole polemic of art was entirely different, yeah? So that would be like maybe a beginning of, uh, to answer your question, let's say, just because we're here in this museum where some of these works uh, can be seen, yeah? But maybe Hita would like to say something to that, or Boris? If I could follow up, it's, um, I think, prescient to bring up the avant-garde because of its importance within art history, but also in this particular institution. I mean, Hito, I found your talk quite contrasting and quite um, exciting in that way because it discussed some more organic um, approaches to, to cosmism, not necessarily the traditional uh, path of the avant-garde in which art and life is brought together through sort of a technological or scientific um, approach. And your, your heralding of today's or, or our cosmos in, in caregivers or, or in love. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Well, um, what else can I say beyond? Or perhaps do you, see, do you see a contradiction between those two paths? The, the the scientific, the technological, and this more organic no, approach. No, 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 no. There, there is no contradiction. I mean, I don't think uh, that 
there is a sort of fundamental difference between nature and technology. I just don't see it. It's a different way of looking at technology, but not through the lens of nature. It's a different uh, aspect of technology. That, and, and I think it's important to emphasize it, no? The labor, the domestic labor is technology. I mean, pure and simple, it's the technology of making and sustaining people. And it should be seen as technology and also valued and discussed as technology. But it's a different aspect, you know, it's maybe less, um, well, it's different, let's put it like that. Before we open it up in our last 15 minutes, do Boris and Arsene, do you have any comments uh, further about the various points discussed? Well, maybe only one, and maybe it's kind of a response to what Hita said. There is, of course, a certain kind of analogy between death and immortality. You know, we speak about life. Uh, we can speak about life at least in two ways. Life as survival, as duration, in terms of duration. And then human being and animal in general uh, begin very much look like a mechanism. Yeah, that also uh, can go further and further. But we wouldn't say that mechanism is uh, a life. Yeah? And, and, and the other way to look at life is to think about the feel life, yeah? to feel yourself alive. Mm. And in a strange way, if you look at the uh, literature, classical literature, also look at Nietzsche, uh, this feeling to be alive uh, emerged at the moment you put your life at risk and you begin to be confronted with death. It's, it's maybe one of the oldest uh, wisdoms here yeah, in European culture and general culture. So there, there is a certain homology between immortality and death. I agree with, uh, with Hita, and there is a certain kind of, uh, certain kind of ecstatic and extreme uh, feeling of uh, life uh, related to immediate experience of the danger of death. And I, I, I think it is interesting in, uh, in what um, uh, Anton uh, did in his uh, film, is that he always keeps this uh, feeling of ecstasy through reminding us of death. Yeah? If we wouldn't be reminded of death, this ecstatic experience an ecstatic uh, desire to be alive wouldn't be not so intense and not so convincing for us. Uh, as I saw uh, this film again, I saw this presence of death is very important. And uh, maybe it's a whole theory of immortality is a reminder of death. Yeah, if we, yeah, if we read it this way, then uh, maybe uh, the whole thing gets a different interpretation. Yeah, I don't want to develop some. Maybe I do that the other place. Well, I think there are probably questions from, from the audience. It's, the lights are very bright. It's very difficult for me to see. Um, I believe there are still people still alive in here <laughs> who have questions. Oh, just please wait for the microphone as this is being live streamed. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, thank the, you. The question is that somehow it seemed about physical continuation of life. And I just wonder about the preoccupation with that as opposed to some other form of life, which is ideas, different kinds of energy of that sort that can certainly uh, live on. I. I developed a kind of corny uh, theory, but I'll just say it. That is that every thought, everything we say, everything we do has a form of energy. And energy goes out somewhere, out into the cosmos. And at some point, there's some way of collecting this energy. 
um, and reconstructing it. It's not a question, but it's just a comment. Oh, but I mean, art is an immortality. Art is also an immortality technology, right? That is not concerned with the immediate survival of the body or the subjectivity, but operates in this more displaced or detached realm. Art has always been this kind of immortality technology. Yes, but, yes, but art changes because people change and societies change and our way of thinking changes. We can assume that something was like it was, but we have no idea. And so uh, it's, it's very ephemeral and trans transitional and transitory. I think uh, energy can be uh, seen and, uh, as synonymic to soul. Yeah, something ideal, you see, the ideas. Uh, but souls and ideas and energies need embodiments. I think what's interesting about cosmism is, is this feeling uh, of necessity of material form. It's also art. It's not about ideas. Art is also about things and forms. Uh, we need uh, materialization. We need embodiment. That's life. Yeah, life is embodiment. Uh, we cannot uh, restrict ourselves to ideas and energies. Any further questions? Yes, in the back and in the middle. In the back first, I saw. Um, so you formulated um, immortality through the lens of death, and I was wondering if anyone could speak to maybe a link between Russian cosmism and idea of necropolitics, of kind of a, a biopower that, that is hinged on the negative, you know, possibility or capacity for death. Um, and in that essay, Patai is also heavily mentioned, which seems to be a recurring thread through a lot of these works. And I was wondering maybe if there was a more specific application of these ideas to, I don't know, like colonialism or a kind of subjugation of masses in 2017 when we began the talk with um, discussing the American political landscape currently. And I was interested in returning maybe to the more present day situation. If anybody has anything to say about that. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely. No one wants to talk about biopower. I mean, I was also during Arseny's talk thinking a lot about um, what's facing contemporary Russia today and sort of this rise of, or not rise, it's been on the rise of uh, Christianity and sort of the religious right and, you know, it came up again in Hito's talk and how, you know, these, these um, ad things are harness, harnessed by uh, these regimes um, and sort of Arseny coming to us from that context if he had something more specific to say to the present day. Uh, well, if you'd like to speak about uh, rise of uh, uh, religion uh, thoughts in Russia in relation to Kasmism, uh, then um, I would say that there is probably no direct connection because once um, Putin mentioned Fyodorov Kamantask during his speech to government and uh, all journalists uh, <coughs> started to write articles on his uh, craziness and uh, immortality, etc., etc. But uh, I guess uh, it's misunderstanding of uh, uh, Fyodorovian uh, um, philosophy and uh, I think that uh, if he would live uh, today, and then definitely he would 
um, um, become prisoner because uh, our cosmist interpretation of religion is uh, really far from orthodox uh, vision of Christianity, especially uh, that we uh, have today in contemporary Russia. Uh, it's more, let's say, creative interpretation of religion, which is uh, much more, much interesting and uh, uh, <clears throat> give us more tools for experimentation with technology and with, uh, uh, with uh, our creativity. So I, I would not connect uh, a contemporary Russian government with an uh, with, uh, uh, interest to cosmism and uh, to religion. I believe we had a question in the center. Someone had raised their hand, but Who would raise it? I believe in the center here, in the beige or white. Sorry, I really can't see. Well, I guess I was thinking about something called terror management theory, which is this idea that, you know, the total fear of death and the realization that it's inevitable is something that leads to culture, so something that leads to the production of art and culture. Um, it's kind of a theory from social psychology. But with Russian cosmism, it seems almost like it's something aiming at the opposite direction. It's aiming at the, la the absence of a fear of death, the death of that anxiety. And so therefore, couldn't it be maybe seen as something that would cause the death of culture as well, or the death of art in its totality? And then I was starting to think, if you guys think that Russian cosmism is in a way a modernist project and kind of suffers from the same ideas that a lot of modernist, avant-gardist things have, which is this destruction of the past, destruction of your origins, um, and just how that might relate to um, the more reactionary uh, sources of like transhumanism and you know their bad taste in art, like from what I understand uh, in some some like Google's art collection, for example. Um, and just, yeah, I just thought maybe if you could take it in that direction. I don't know if that's... A well, I think that the avant-garde in general, not only Russian avant-garde, but also Bauhaus, for example, the style, they try to change society uh, by changing the basis, the material basis of society's existence. So if we take a classical relationship between base and uh, superstructure, yeah, classical Marxist relationship, uh, then uh, here art is operates on the material basis of existence. And the same is uh, cosmism. So the, the answer is uh, let us, uh, let us uh, stabilize and create new conditions for the human existence not only to change the human psyche, but to change the human bodies and to change the conditions of their existence. I wouldn't say it's reactionary. And I also uh, agree uh, with Arseny that cosmism has a very strong Marxist socialist component in itself. Um, uh, what, uh, let's say, Orthodox Church uh, never had and uh, doesn't have today. So even if there are some religious hopes present that they uh, want to realize, want to embody, and so want to bring into life, then the structure and the means to achieve these goals are actually socialist and technological. They are avant-garde, artistic avant-garde means, and not uh, traditional Christian. Uh, church um, uh, organized means. We have time for one more question. That does this mean? Or, I mean if, it, if I may return the question, because I'm just fascinated by this idea that, you know, then in, in consequence, every museum, this museum would be an institution for terror management, right? Yeah. So basically, all the art in there is supposed to capture you know, the anxieties of the population. The museum becomes like a black hole of terror, right? <laughs> That's really interesting. <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> it's, it's like a terror bank. You go here to deposit <laughs> your terror. <laughs> Maybe it will build some interest. You never know. <laughs> More terror. <laughs> We're all going to feel really different coming to work tomorrow. <laughs> um, we have time for one more question. Was there one in the back before? Or um, up here, uh, down here in the third row, fourth row, in black? Um, I was kind of struck by Hito's reference to caregivers, um, effective labor. And I was thinking about, rather than a textual or theoretical reading of death, a kind of practice of death, or a pushing back on a, you know, I'm, I'm very, I can understand historically why it's important to go to Russian cosmism right now, in so much as it's a certain kind of, un, it's unend, upending a certain kind of duality that we need to upend in art in general. And it is a certain kind of heading that way. It's not accidental, it's very male driven. It's also not accidental that there's a certain kind of ignorance to a certain kind of cultural practice that's been dealing with death for a long time. And I was thinking about like, when you know, the kind of reference to, to caregivers or to a certain kind of practice of death, if you will, or those that care for the living, a technology of dealing with it, rather than perhaps the terror management. Because I think, in fact, historically, there are plenty of cultures that have managed death just fine. And it isn't, in fact, terror at all. Um, I'm wondering, in your own kind of thinking through a practice of death, like when you were in Kazakhstan filming, you know, and you, you've got that, like, what about the kind of operations of living a certain kind of dealing with death, rather than a theorizing of that? And how, you know, I'm not familiar with Russian cosmism so much. And I've kind of just got a barrage from all of you, so I'm just like dealing with a lot with it. But I was thinking like, how do you, what is, how did that play into your thinking? And was that a part of it? And sort of just, rather than just a theorizing, was there a, a kind of theorizing of how to practice death in terms of a life? Well, uh, it's a strange question because my father was dying at the time. So I had a kind of a very direct experience of actually dealing with somebody dying extremely close to me. So it was not an abstraction, it was not a kind of a, intellectual sort of curiosity, but yeah. Um, but I think, you know, maybe to come back to the question of caregiving and all of that, you know, cosmism in a certain way does come out of this kind of religious tradition where basically everybody within these religious organizations are, in a sense, caregivers, right? More than to some extent in the secular society, I, it, I'm not a particularly religious person and I have never been a member of a monastic order or some kind of a yeah, uh, clergy, but clergy serves, yeah, right? They're supposed to serve, right? So in a sense, that's exactly kind of what they do and one of the main cares that they provide is to soothe this anxiety of death, right? This is what religion, I mean, that's one of the very basic kind of uh, explanations of how it, it sort of functions in society. Uh, I don't know, Hito, what do you think? I, I don't have a comment. Well, perhaps if there are no further comments, we will conclude the evening with a lot to think about, a lot to take home. Um, Thank you all. Uh, thank you to our panelists, to those organizing and supporting this event, and of course to all of you for joining us tonight here at MoMA. Thank you.